India is uh, the world's biggest and largest democracy. That means the elections that transpired in India are also the grandest, the biggest, but also riddled with complexities and layers upon layers. When elections take place in India, it makes for world headlines, not because of who's winning or who's losing, but in a country which consists of so many people, it's important to understand that how India makes this happen every five years with such success and such results, which are not only transparent, but true to the spirit of a democratic nation. What does this mean for uh, the international community as well, where India has cemented its place as not only an active player, but a dominant partner, not because of its oratory, but because of its actions. Joining us today to talk more about this are two illustrious diplomats who are going to be weighing in as to what these elections mean for the country and what kind of a message do they send to the world as well. Ambassador Bhaswati Mukherjee, former ambassador, is uh, with us on the broadcast. Ambassador Suresh Kumar Goel, former diplomat, also joins us to weigh in on this big announcement that was made today. Ambassador Mukherjee, I'll begin with you, ma'am. It's uh, a momentous occasion. You know, the dance of democracy, as we like to call it, is at play. You know, what's in fact intimidating and overwhelming is the fact that the Election Commission is able to pull this off along with the several other assembly elections that happen, you know, before and after the general elections, time and again with such precision and immaculate consistency that this should itself become a course in a Stanford or a Harvard University. But the fact of the matter is, when India goes on to select uh, you know, the Prime Minister for the next five years, the government for the next five years, what will, uh, you know, the people of this country be voting for and what kind of an attention the international community is going to be, in fact, putting on, on India as well. Let us not forget that India has cemented its place in a lot of forums where we earlier were not welcome. So this is not just an election for India, for Indians, but this is also a testimony to which the world and the world community, the international community has, you know, put in a lot of aspirations on. Thank you, Vineet, uh, for inviting me to this important program. Uh, I completely agree with you that um, elections in India are a source of admiration across the world. Uh, my colleague, Ambassador Goyal and myself have both been have both served in the United Nations and I can assure you that even when India was not in the position that it presently is, the manner in which we conduct our elections was always commented upon with admiration and awe, uh, not just by developing countries but also by developed countries because we actually introduced voting machines and EVMs throughout the length and breadth of this vast country of ours, well before other countries and even today, for example, if you remember in the United States there have been presidential elections where uh, the uh, votes were counted late, etc., etc., because it's still done manually uh, in the United States, whereas in India we have gone far ahead. Uh, further, the fact that elections are always held on time, except for one exception, that's the emergency, but then one has to accept that Mrs. Gandhi uh, understood and went back to India's democratic pattern by calling for elections. So even if you could say that there was an aberration for the period of the emergency, but the person who called the emergency herself went back to India's democratic pattern. So we could proudly say that since we became independent, since we became a democracy, we have actually been democratic, held elections on time, and have held up the, the, uh, the democratic pattern of governance, even, when, even during a time when our neighborhood was uh, a sea of dictatorship with India's democracy shining out like a beacon. Uh, that is no longer the case. There are some democracies around us. Some are weak, some are semi-functional, some are run from the back. But I would still call them democracies because I prefer to call them democracies. I would always uh, say that India will always support any democracy, be it weak, civilian democracy or not. But there can be no doubt that our democratic model is an example for people to set. Finally, you asked about what the people of India look for. Uh, I think our Prime Minister put it very well some months ago when he talked about Vikas and Virasat. Uh, I would say that today's India looks for both and certainly today's India looks for Vikas, looks for development, 
uh, that is what the people of India want. Uh, I I would say that whichever government delivers on development has an excellent chance of getting elected or re-elected because we are marching ahead strongly. Uh, we hope that we would become the world's third largest democracy. And when that would happen, then indeed we would be able to truly empower those who deserve to be empowered, who have been exploited for centuries of colonial rule. And then after that, and 47 onwards, where we have struggled so hard to distribute our GDP evenly. Uh, so I would say I would weigh in very heavily uh, on Vikas, on development, and, and to say that whichever party manages to convince the voter that the main mandate is Vikas would have an excellent chance of winning the election. Mm. Absolutely. Good points there. Ambassador Goel, do you think the elections today are beyond Roti, Kapra or Makan? I read somewhere that it's no longer Roti, Kapra or Makan. It is Roti, Kapra, Makan or Desh Ki Shan that also affects or rather influences a voter to go out there and vote for his favorite leader or his party. Uh, you have seen these, uh, you know, these, these elements and these processes more than I have, sir. What has changed for India in the last uh, couple of decades? Why I say a couple of decades? Because obviously that would also include what the UPA did and that would also include what the NDA has done. Uh, Vidhi, uh, I don't think I can say it any better than my colleague has already said. Ambassador Bhaswati Mukherjee, and I think she has brought many points together in the short while that she spoke. I would only say one thing. I, I stay out of basically the politics of uh, the elections per se. Uh, I don't think that this is the forum for me to comment on the politics of the elections. But what I would say really here is that uh, having seen the international opinion and having worked on different international platforms, one thing that I will say about Indian democracy per se, and I consider elections to be the festival of Indian democracy, is that nowhere there is any doubt mind of anyone, whether they are opposed to us, they work with us, or they, whether it is Pakistan or whether it is Afghanistan, you name whichever country, whichever people, there is no doubt in minds of anyone at all that democracy in India has taken root, that not democracy is the institution which flourishes in india and if there is any change in the government if there is any way for the governance here democracy is the only way for which the governance takes place in this country now every every model of governance there would be what there would be uh, uh blemishes there would be everything but the main point really here is that democracy has taken root here and there's nothing else but democracy and the elections is the only way and nobody you know for example you mentioned about uh change of the government while in the many many countries in the neighborhood many countries in the world there is always a kind of speculation whether there would be a coup this could take place the arguments could come on the road no at no point in time during my life period since i was have been working or even before that, my father, at no point in time since 1947, has anybody ever thought that the governments in India could change except through elections. And I think that's a great success here. And when we say Deshki Shan, all kinds of economic models will be worked on and we will keep on arguing, debating what is good, what is not good, etc., etc. But I think the country is held at all times by everyone as an example of democracy and how democracy can succeed in the country the, un, not depending on the economic uh, level of the level of the economic growth or economic uh, development and i think that's a great success that we have achieved mm -hmm. and i would put that to the fact that people in india in their thinking are democratic nowhere have i seen an indian taking up a castle on behalf of others or for anyone at all for any issue that you believe in, we tend to basically defend or we tend to argue. We tend to debate issues. And I think that's the greatest strength of democracy, that we debate the issues, we work on the issues, and we, uh, I would say, vote on the basis of the issues, really. And 
whichever party comes whichever party is democracy will be for the standard will mm. all right to general sudhakar ji defense expert with us on the program as uh, well uh, major general dhruv katoch also joins us on the broadcast general sudhakar ji i'll begin with you i hope you can hear me sir yeah yeah <coughs> so what do you think dif- differentiates you know indians and you know you know the, the the common indian going out there and voting for his favorite uh, party what do you think differentiates us vis-a-vis a country uh you know i'm this this is no comparison whatsoever vis-a-vis a country like a syria or a iran where the predominant need for the government of that particular nation or state is to offer protection that is something which is taken care of in india if that was an issue then people would be voting on that do you think it has all boiled down to roti kapla or makan makan and desh ki shan and do you think the you know the india has in fact proven in more ways than one that when it comes to democracy uh you know the color and the variety of uh, you know uh, uh, agendas that you see are never ending and that is why the lok sabha elections become that more interesting that more endearing and that more reflective of what we are all about yeah vinith uh, thank you good evening for uh, thank you for getting me to your show and compliments to the previous co panelists well your question is centering around the terminology called democracy and often when we discuss or study about this uh, uh, more often than not people tend to refer to greek uh, civilization uh, as a founding father of the concept of democracy i think uh, unmindful of the fact that democracy had very deep roots in our civilization in india 7000 8000 years ago so when you talk about democracy or uh, you know try and dilate the factor of panchayati raj much before independence this was very much prevalent india as a civilization actually held out because of a, a kind of a kind of a i, I would say uh, eternal um, network of the concept and the practice of democracy in our way of life so having said that you made quite a few important points and if i take uh, the blessings of my senior fraternity general uh, katoch Uh, well whatever you have said uh, roti kapda makan and uh, desh ke shaan i would give an extension of what we understand when we talk about the pride and uh, we dedicate our life for the national security you see naam namak nishan is something which we tend to forget and we very widely practice preach and make it a way of life in the armed forces today the day has come 75 years after our independence every citizen of india has got a self pride and 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 uh, there is a self conviction he started asserting from within there is a self esteem which is speaking volumes about it second point i wish to highlight is is that it is not only roti kapda makan or desh ki shan it is much more than that it is the security it is uh, the economics it is the diplomacy i would compliment there are two senior ambassadors in the panel today and i would say with a lot of pride and uh, and conviction that uh, we are the best there is nobody who are parallel or comparable with the the capability of our diplomatic efforts and the personality that the, the nation has produced and next comes is the military might by and by not withstanding the the very balanced view and the approach we have been taking towards the national security people have been taking reference of a uh, low percentage of gdp that's not the way to calculate we have to balance out the socio economic factor the, the 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 national security the defense versus the development i would say the whole nation is actually craving for one thing today surge and rise in economics and concomitantly we should also strive each one of us a self discipline youth is going to be the demand of the time and we need to actually discipline our uh, youth bulge which is very huge 65% mm-hmm. there has to be internal stability there has to be national security along the external borders there has to be a kind of a focus on to many issues particularly the infrastructure development along the border the northern as also the western border we need to enhance our footprint okay. to provide Uh, security towards the the maritime borders or the coastal areas along the island territories also we need to have uh, extended outreach for diplomatic efforts to maintain very balanced relationship in today's multilateralism which is expanding by the day in a polarized understood world. understood on the list yeah. only one yeah. sentence 
I would say the call of the hour today is actually to take the nation along. There is a high degree of polarization which I have gone around the country in the past couple of days to many states. There is a feeling which is coming from pulse of the people today that some minority of some segment of the population, they feel slightly uh, um, neglected. They need to be taken on board. Perhaps that outreach is the need of the hour. Everyone in the ruling governance is doing a wonderful job. This is the best that India has had so far in 75 years. But okay. we need to go in for the last mile connectivity and meeting the aspiration all of right, the people. Sir. All right, sir. Let me, let me also open Major General Dhruv Katoch into this conversation. General Katoch, well, you know, one chapter is closing. The next one is going to open. Uh, the next chapter, obviously, is replete with aspirations of us becoming the third largest economy. But, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the long, you know, career that you've had and, you know, the innings that you have played and seen governments come and go, do you think these past 10 years are the best that we have had? Uh, thank you, Vineet. <clears throat> Vineet, in many ways, I think, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, confine my remarks specifically to uh, defense and security preparedness as far as the nation is concerned. Absolutely, sir. And uh, I think as far as the last decade is concerned, it has been remarkable on quite a few counts. And I just want to enumerate these counts because I, I hope and pray, regardless of which government comes in, these what has happened in the defense sector in the last decade continues with the same and with greater momentum. Now, I think the first thing which has happened is, you know, the way uh, the defense production capacity and capability has been strengthened. Now, defense takes a very long time. So when we are looking at the last 10 years, it is really not an appropriate time, uh, uh, you know, time capsule to view events. It, it, we require a much larger period. But the process has been set. You know, with the establishment of two industrial bases, one in UP and one in uh, Tamil Nadu, you are going to get for the first time a defense industrial base in India, which is strong. You know, where the, uh, the small and medium sectors play a very major role. And I think that is going to be a game changer. This is one. Number two, as for policies, for the first time, we have actually made, uh, made defense production something which we can export. And the prime minister himself has given out, uh, uh, you know, certain, uh, uh, certain yardsticks as to we would like our defense exports to reach this particular target. Now, I'm quite confident and uh, confident that uh, our defense capacities will actually achieve those numbers and will, uh, and will cross them tremendously. The third major reform, you know, for very long, defense was considered a holy cow and the private sector was kept out. The private sector has been brought in now. This, is, this has been majorly done in the last decade. And I feel that when we are looking at the next five years or the next decade from now, this needs a much greater push. There has been great resistance from various quarters. Uh, there were interested parties who were more interested in imports than in uh, local manufacture. But I think all that is history now. We are on a different trajectory. So when we are looking at, uh, uh, at defense, uh, our capacity to manufacture, our capacity to export, with the coming in of the private sector, it is a game changer. And I hope it continues with much renewed vigor. And also, uh, our industrialists get into the act because this is a very big playing field which will provide great, uh, uh, a great number of jobs. It will make us self-assured and it will give various other benefits in terms of job, employment, etc., etc. One more point, two more points I want to give as far as this is concerned. One is the thrust which has been laid on communication infrastructure right up to our borders. Now, I've served in the Northeast as a divisional commander and uh, the state of communication was something, you know, when we are going up to say uh, uh, the McMahon line, uh, you, you know, there was always that thinking, why can't our roads be better when we are looking across at the Chinese side and we see the infrastructure they had? That has changed over the last decade tremendously. I mean, just recently now, you, you know, the tunnel has gone through Sela. It is going to reduce the time and make it a 20, you, you know, uh, uh, we, we will not be dependent on the weather to get supplies up to Taiwan uh, through Sela, regardless of uh, the type of weather which is there. Now, a whole series of tunnels, the roads going right up to the borders, I think that has made a huge impact on our capability to react to any situation uh, which, which could present itself. Yeah. And that's the last point which I want to bring about is, you know, when we're looking at personnel, um, you know, we, the, the, um, the scheme, the, the policies which have been rolled out by the Indian Armed Forces as well as the government, 
Uh, they may require a bit of tweaking. They've been there now for two to three years, three years, I think. And uh, uh, it, um, it, let's see as to how far that goes. But you cannot jettison any scheme uh, just because certain people aren't comfortable with it. We have to go through with it. And I've spoken to quite a few of the senior officers in the military. They're quite happy with the scheme, but they have also said that as we go along and we gain experience, we will carry out certain changes. And I think that is a fair one. All in all, I think when we are looking at it, uh, I agree with my uh, co-panelist, you know, when he said, you know, it, it, it's not a question of really the how much money comes in terms of GDP uh, to the defense. Uh, in fact, I don't believe in that in any case. You know, if your economy doubles, your same percentage also doubles. So uh, to, to that extent, I don't think uh, see there's a problem. But I don't think we, we should uh, peg, G, peg our defense to GDP. Mm. We should peg our defense to requirements regardless of the impact on GDP. Okay. So if there is a requirement for a greater increase, so be it. If there is a requirement for lesser, so be it. Because we have to assess the threats which we are faced with. All right. Pakistan is one threat, China is the other, the, the oceans are the third. And how we react to these threats is something which I think we will have to see. We need. All right. Absolutely. So we've heard it from uh, the diplomats, we've heard it from the defense experts. Let's also bring in uh, you know, an economic angle to this, Mr. Jayajit Bhattacharya, President for Center of Digital Economy and Policy Research, also joins us on the show. Mr. Bhattacharya, seven phases. The results are going to be out on the 4th of June. If we talk about India's uh, uh, fiscal prowess and prudence and the economic uh, sanctity that we've been able to pull through despite pandemics like COVID-19. How do you think the country is going to spend the next five years and what kind of an economic trajectory, of course, a positive and an upward economic trajectory do you envisage for the NDA, hoping and perhaps calculating very wisely that they will come back to power for a third term? You know, we have almost taken it for granted that... Uh, <laughs> exactly. I realized that in the middle of my sentence post-COVID-19 is uh, kind of granted. Uh, other large economies have failed to manage it. Uh, Germany, France, US, Japan. UK is, in UK, is, UK is in recession. UK, right? I mean, all of them. And um, and not just us. I mean, the entire country is taking it for granted that uh, economic recovery post-COVID was something that was supposed to be had on a platter. And I think that's one of the key reasons why India is in the pole position from an economic perspective. And we are a shining light globally. Um, also, um, we have managed to be away from any conflicts and that has a deep impact on uh, the economic structure that we are inheriting to move forward in the next five years. Uh, clearly, uh, unemployment and job creation continues to be issues, but you know the issues is not very even across the country. And since you mentioned the polling will happen uh, in seven phases in seven different geographies of the country, even the inflation rate for that matter is different across all of these places. So we do come up with one national inflation rate, but what each of these regions are facing are significantly different. And therefore there will be pockets where there is a severe issue of unemployment, of underemployment for that matter, in where most of the farming and agricultural issues is related to underemployment, uh, if not hidden employ unemployment. Uh, I think that will continue to be an issue. And um, you know we can probably try and absorb a lot of, um, uh, uh, of, of labor uh, through a rapid uh, infrastructure and housing creation. Uh, but then we need to keep in mind that we should not be in the same trap that China is right now, where they have done all the housing that needs to be done. Now there is no more need for housing and there's overcapacity. And the entire economy is, uh, is now at a questionable uh, juncture. So there needs to be other ways of creating employment and not just by creating houses and infrastructure. Although this government is doing a brilliant job on both, both of those uh, areas. So we need to think of other ways. Now, clearly, if you look at the data, uh, manufacturing is zooming through. There's some 43% growth in the manufacturing sector, which is humongous. And hopefully in the next five years, manufacturing will finally step in as a large part of the economy, which will start creating the jobs that we really need. Um, the other aspect of uh, the, the economic recovery post COVID and the job creation is inflation of cost of living. Now, clearly there has been inflation. There has been an impact of cost of living but it is nowhere near to what the rest of the world has faced. Uh, we are not facing 50% inflation, 80% inflation. We are still reasonably around the 6% mark, which is what is acceptable uh, uh, everywhere. But um, you know, given that politics is politics, uh, even that 6% number will be politicized. The fact that there has been an actual increase in cost of living will be politicized. Uh, but the reality is that we have fared far better than anyone else. 
uh, when for two years almost the economy was uh, was not uh, operating at its peak level and still we managed to uh, put a lid on inflation. I think we all deserve a pat in the back and you know, especially the government deserves a pat in the back for that particular aspect. Hmm. I think the other key issue is agricultural reforms. Uh, in this particular regime of the last five years, uh, attempts were made to have to to make agricultural sector reforms, but that did not really work out. Now, let me just look at uh, Punjab specifically. Uh, I have myself been involved trying to get some 220 acres of contiguous land for setting up um, pharmaceutical uh, uh, manufacturing. We could not get a contiguous piece of land, and finally, that investment may went to some other state. Now, even for that piece of land, uh, the cost of land is extremely high because of the fact that anything that you create on that land is subsidized by the government. So there is a much more, much higher return, a uh, supposed distorted return from agriculture from that land than in any other place in this country. And therefore, <laughs> what happens is that if manufacturing is not coming up in a place like Punjab, the, the absorption of labor from agriculture to manufacturing will not happen. And therefore, we'll be continuously stuck in this low income for farmers because either you increase uh, the price of food, uh, which will lead to food inflation, or you increase the amount of acreage under each farmer, which means number of farmers have to reduce. Okay. Uh, now for a number of farmers to reduce, we need to have more manufacturing in place. Manufacturing cannot happen if the cost of land is that high and you don't have contiguous piece of land. So those are issues which are quite complex. They are different from different uh, parts of this country. And I hope uh, that in the next okay. five, those are looked at because, you know, we can't be a, a, a superpower or a regional power with 60% of our population engaged in uh, agriculture. In US, it's 2%. In, in Brazil and China, it's less than 10%. 60% is quite unacceptable. And uh, that is really needs to be addressed in order to get the workforce away from agriculture into, pro into far more productive industrial and uh, the, the tertiary industry. All uh, right. Also, the uh, okay. GST and taxation policies that needs to be ironed out. Uh, there are cross-border taxation issues that needs to be ironed out. Yeah, those 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 will happen. Dr. Sharath Kohli, senior economist, also joins us on the program. Dr. Kohli, are you there with us? Yes, absolutely. Dr. Kohli, when when you are going to go to the polling booth and you're going to look at that report card in your hand, uh, for whomever you are voting for, what will that report card entail? And uh, why would you vote for that particular party? On what grounds and what basis? What have they done in the last five, ten years, according to you, subjectively, that you would want to vote for them? Well, uh, good evening, Mirith, and good evening to all the panelists and news, news ex viewers. The part of the country where I am, I think uh, there's Hobson's choice as far as uh, the, the the voting is concerned. So uh, I think I think the image of the country, Vineet, over the last uh, ten years. I think I've gone through a sea change, uh, the way we used to be 10 years ago, from being fragile five today to being amongst top five. <clears throat> I mean, being, being an economist, I mean, I would, I would have a very biased outlook from that perspective because we've come a long way from that uh, a fragile five today. We are the fifth largest. We are on our way to become the third largest. It could be in the next couple of years or maybe three years or so. And, you know, overall, uh, I think when the GDP increases, a very, very pertinent question, Vineet, uh, that when GDP, somebody was asking me, that when GDP increases, what do people of the country get? Is it just a number? So it's not a number. GDP, after all, is, is an addition of goods and services being produced by each one of us. So I think the best way to look at it, Vineet, if, uh, the question which you asked me, and this I would want every citizen to ask themselves, a very easy way of judging how the government has done, a very, very easy way, a very simple way. Uh, position yourself in 2014. Where were you? What was your economic position? What was your own economy? How was your own economy doing in 2014? And in 2024, where has your own economy reached? I mean, we easily forget ourselves. We we'll keep looking outside. But I think you need to look at your, your prosperity, how many properties you had, what kind of job you were doing, what were your bank balances, how much was your monthly income, how much was your annual income, how many people in your family were earning, and so on and so forth. I think that provides Vineet a very easy answer. But as far as the government is concerned, I think they have done a fantastic job, but there is work in progress. We cannot say that we've reached a milestone and there's nothing more to be achieved from here. That's not the, the, the point. There, there are still a lot of areas which I'm sure Prime Minister Modi and his team is looking to continue. Especially infrastructure is something which, which they have done marvelously well. But then the country was so much lacking in infrastructure over the last 65 years that I think there's a lot to be done there. 
Then mm. a very important aspect as a voter I would look is when uh, you know JG spoke about manufacturing. Manufacturing is doing fantastically, but then there are a lot of industries who are skill who are, who are finding themselves wanting for skill. They don't find people you know who are skilled enough. So I think education and skill development I feel we need are still to be looked at. You know there's a long way to go as far as skill because if you really want to uh, get on top in manufacturing, if you really want to replace China. You know, we need to catch up with our skills. Then, of course, as I said, skill and education, then agri sector. I, you know, the, these frequent resentments, whether whether it is very localized, agri reforms, as I agree with Dr. Bhattacharya, there, there is a lot to be done on agri sector. We need to make the, in fact, what I would say is, I would I would go a little further than what Dr. Jayjeet said, that not only just pulling out force from agriculture, but also making agriculture a profitable activity. Let agriculture not be a liability on the uh, on the country. You know, it's it's become a kind of a liability. So at least some part of it. But most of the farmers are very small farmers, two acres of land, and you know uh, that too not owned by them. They are contract farmers and so and so forth. So I think agriculture sector per se has to be brought into profit. I think for me that's the biggest challenge, and that that also you know uh, imbibes in itself the problem of unemployment because this problem of unemployment is is very much related. To bringing the agri sector, this disguised unemployment, which Dr. Bhattacharya was speaking about, I completely agree. There, I think manufacturing make in India is very good. It's doing very well. Manufacturing sector growth has been fantastic. But then the ease of doing business, I think there is still some miles to go. As far as this, I'm giving you the feedback of the foreign companies, of the foreign investors who are coming and and setting up the uh, the industry here. Then I think uh, off late, if somebody has been following economic parameters of the country. Our trade deficit is still very, very, you know, worrisome. We we did 18 to 19 billion dollars of trade deficit. I am speaking as retail, as recent as last month. So I think the imports from China is a matter of concern from me. With the tensions building on the border, and you know the latest report from America coming on the India-China tension. That somebody reported that you know uh, there is there is very very uh, severe tension on the India-China border, and we continue to import and not just import. But we continue to depend on China for a lot of raw material and finished products. So I think we need to get rid of this dependence sooner than later, because we could suddenly be in a situation we need where hmm. we would find that we are no more dealing with China, and all of a sudden, you know, some part of the country comes to a standstill from an economic perspective. So hmm. I think uh, India needs to very quickly this Atman Nirbhar Abhiyan needs to really, really catch pace as per me, and you know all the. Hundred billion dollar plus of imports from China have to come down. I think this must be counting on Prime Minister's, uh, Prime Minister Modi's mind from uh, from that perspective. So mm. I would say there is work in progress. We've come a long way. We've done very very well, Vineet. But okay. then there is work in progress. So as a voter, I would look at the last ten years. At the same time, I would also look at the next ten years to see as to whether this government is capable of taking us. And the answer would be yes because it has already shown its prowess. Mm. Jill Sudhakar ji. Uh, how would you respond to what Dr. Kohli has said? You know, apart from, you know, what India has done in terms of its defense capabilities, Atmanirbhata, self-reliance, you know, there is always this white elephant in the room, which we call China. Uh, and it's a big elephant. And, you know, we have been, in fact, uh, sporadically dealing with this problem. But do you think that this is also an agenda for the people who want to see the Modi government return to power? Because in the last 10 years, you know, we have not really been browbeaten by China as we used to get back in the days. Uh, thank you, Vinit, for asking this question to me. Uh, the major portion of the answer would be in a classified domain because of evolving dynamics. I I'll try to give them out, but uh, I can't compliment uh, the previous co-panelist, uh, Mr. Kohli, enough for having actually outlined the very basic tenant of the progress in development. He is, I think, one of the, uh, the best economists that one has come across in the country and the world order. But having said that, uh, Vinit, just allow me to make very quick reflections. First and foremost is today we are in the 21st century. In the 21st century, call it Cold War 2.0 or whatever. Some people are calling it the 2.2, call it by any name. The dynamics are changing. What are these dynamics related to the defense preparedness? The dynamics are at one point in time, about three or four years back, not only India, all over the world, everyone was talking short and swift war. 
that concept has turned into a myth. The short and swift war, which everyone expected in Ukraine to last for seven days, 15 days. Maybe I was the only one. Maybe General Kotoj was another one. He, he's so well read and researched into the subject. We held out. We said, no, it's going to go beyond the timeline. Today, this particular conflict has gone beyond. It has disproved all the tenets and parameters of military science. It has gone beyond three years now. If you actually count from 2014, the conflict actually did not begin on 24th of February 2022. As a military man, I would say it started way back in 2008. Uh, to be more precise, bring it down further, 2014. That is the duration for which Russia has been actually contesting this particular conflict. So what does it actually relate to? It relates to being self-reliant. What is the meaning of self-reliant? Today, in the world order, the Western alliance cannot produce more than 8,000 to 10,000 shells, artillery shells in a month. The requirement of Ukraine is touching almost about 24 to 34,000 minimum bottom line. Whereas Russia can produce 500,000 shells. That is the kind of you know production lineup that they have. They have actually proven the capability which they had demonstrated way back in Second World War. What is the third, the next point that I wish to highlight? There is a requirement there are some conceptual framework of defense preparedness. We earlier were prepared for a certain number of days. Now we have to beat that particular milestone in the spectrum of preparedness. We have to extend those days of preparations going beyond two months, three months. For example, China has got 55 days of reserve of oil. Now China also doesn't know how to stock up much more than 55 days. It is actually, you know, beating about the bush and going left, right and center, you know, going for the CPEC, going for the CMEC and other places, how to enhance its replenishment capabilities so that it remains prepared for a prolonged or extended kind of a conflict. Same in the case with India. We have gone in for manufacturing of the shells. We have gone in for the manufacturing of the ammunition, self-dependent. There are many steps which right. have been taken in the past okay. two to three. All right. Last but not the least, one line. Quickly, sir. That, quickly, that quickly, sir. Is, no matter what we do, we have to not only remain prepared for the adversary, that is the elephant in the room is China, because there is definite challenges looming very, very loudly on the northern sky. It can actually, you know, go back on our face. Therefore, we have to actually remain prepared and prepare our response matrix in a very, very calibrated manner. All right, so all right, all right. Mr. Dilip Cherian, political commentator, founder of Perfect Relations, also joins us on the show. Mr. Cherian, appreciate you taking out the time and speaking with NewsX. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Well, the Lok Sabha dates have been announced today. 4th June is when uh, the result is going to come out. It's a seven-phase uh, election uh, process, which is going to start uh, in a few weeks' time. Uh, you know, the current government is very, very hopeful, very affirmative, very positive, aspirational as well, that they will come back for a third term. Uh, whatever has happened in the last 10 years, they credit to their work. It is not PR, it is not hyperbolic in nature. They say that it's the report card, it's the work that they have done on the ground, and the people-to-people -people connect that they've been able to establish is going to yield them uh, another victory in 2024. When you look at the situation, when you look at India today, and if you compare it, if you juxtapose it to what existed in 2014, what feelings do you feel uh, you know, come to your mind? What has changed in this de decade? There is absolutely very little doubt that there have not been major changes. The changes are the following. India has emerged as a much more aggressive power on the global scenario. We have spent a massive amount on infrastructure investments and we have also sensibly buttressed our enthusiasm for providing uh, those at the bottom of the pyramid with the support that they need in these times. These are all on the positive side. On the other side, we have the issues to do with the macroeconomics of the country. We have issues to do with inflation. And we also have concerns about where the extent of, uh, shall I say, an overbearing bureaucracy in, uh, in many areas continues to rule the roost. So I think that there's a balance sheet that needs to be looked at. And for a start, I think from an economic perspective, these are the main issues that come to mind. 
and not going into the details of either socio-economics or geopolitics. Broadly, these are the issues before the nation in terms of what needs to be looked at today. Hmm. All right. Anjan Roy, former advisor, Economic Affairs. Vicky is also with us on the broadcast. Mr. Roy, are you there with us? Yes. Sir, appreciate you speaking with us. Uh, well, why do you think India is going to vote, uh, you know, the NDA for a third term? W what has gone into, uh, you know, making the image that India has today? And what kind of efforts are, you know, absolutely palpable and apparent to the person who's going to go to the polling booth and vote for his particular party? See, the people who the people will vote for, one doesn't know. But presumably, if you take the record into account, uh, uh, the this government has provided a stable framework. Uh, we have got a very stable framework, fiscal framework, what we have been asking for for a very long time. Uh, you don't come uh, to every budget and see that the rates of taxation are uh, unrecognizable from what it was previous year. So uh, we have got a very stable fiscal regime and that is very important. Then the government has been proactive also. I mean, uh, for example, uh, uh, I mean, giving, giving uh, incentives for some of the industries which are which will uh, introduce the future. Um, uh, for example, these chips, the, uh, the, the emphasis on developing chips, uh, industrial chips in this country, this is a very important uh, area. Then uh, some of the uh, emerging areas like uh, artificial intelligence, all this. But where we are lacking is you know, we don't have as yet that muscular manufacturing industry. We need a very muscular manufacturing industry which is churning out volume of production that is lacking so far uh, even now and that cannot happen without the state governments being very actively involved in the entire process see even today if you want some land from uh, for industry it's not very easy i mean we have not been able to develop a very stable uh, flourishing land market for industry so uh, other factors of production uh, those are some of the areas which need to be taken care of uh, before we really uh, embark on a uh, on a on a world scale uh, manufacturing uh, location but but things are very uh, propitious for us in the sense that everybody is looking an alternative for china uh, vietnam is uh, emerging as a major um, major source but compared to india vietnam is uh, just one little uh, state of the country so our scope is so much bigger and we have not so far been able to encash on that potential. Hmm. Right. Mr. Bhattacharya, you agree with what Mr. Roy said that our scope is a lot bigger. We just have not been able you know, to put in the effort, rather not put in the effort, political will to make that uh, you know, into something which will fructify in the next few years. No, um, uh, actually, a lot of cleaning up had to be done. In fact, one of the panelists said that um, we need to do a lot more in ease of doing business, even though a lot has already been done, because there is a humongous amount of work that has piled up over the decades, and uh, that needs to be executed if India really needs to, uh, you know, cater to ourselves. Forget about being a world power, uh, given that our population still continues to grow. Uh, a, a, we have got a huge workforce need which needs to be proactively engaged. Uh, just to do that, we really need to uh, execute a lot of uh, reforms, uh, which needs to be done at a very urgent pace. And uh, and, and therefore, uh, there is indeed a lot to be done. Um, now, what will happen in the next five years, hopefully, is that um, the base has been created. Uh, you know, the rocket is, is now filled with the fuel needed to be launched. And uh, therefore, we should be able to accelerate the reforms that are required. We should be able to provide for the, the, the increased aspirations of our people. And it's rightly so, you know, people must aspire and those aspirations uh, needs to be fulfilled. Uh, and that can be fulfilled only if people get better educated, better skilled, uh, because you can, just can't be born and, and therefore have a uh, demand that I'll get a job. 
uh, the, the, the skilling and the education also needs to go hand in hand. And those are also part of the reforms. Um, and so if you don't get the skills, you will get into agriculture, which is also a skilled industry. But that's a skill that you will inherit from, um, you know, from your from your family, from your parents and so on. But to get skills which are needed for new industries and new kind of uh, services, uh, really, we need to have very different kind of skilling, um, you know, to bring in the old uh, bugbear of AI, of uh, extreme automation. Uh, those are all true. Those are not something uh, which are fanciful. And we have seen them uh, actually uh, uh, significantly destroying jobs towards the end of 2023. All right. And that trend continued uh, in the first quarter of 2024, as we speak. Uh, and, and therefore, there will be a lot of challenges that we faced uh, by, the in, by the incoming government. But the base has been... Uh, right. Okay. We've almost run out of time, Mr. Cherian. Do you think that uh, the next five years is also a big opportunity for this government and also an opportunity for the people who are going to be voting them into power, uh, you know, to help out with the agendas which perhaps, you know, have been pestering them as well as the people of this country for the last 10 years? Which is, of course, unemployment, inflation. These are some of the, you know, problems that come up time and again. Don't forget that the people, the large mass of people who vote in this country are those who are not necessarily in the urban classes of a certain income strata that we're talking about. As far as the poor are concerned, they need a confidence that somebody is concerned about their basics. They need confidence that prices will not go completely out of control. They also have aspirations and their aspirations are about jobs and also about the places where they will live. So I think urban planning, uh, the ability to provide transportation, the highways that connect the various remote parts of the country, these are going to be issues on which the public will vote. And I think that we need to recognize that today's emerging young voter, who is right. 18 today and was 38 when he last voted perhaps, the, these are the people that need to have their aspirations fulfilled in all the manifestos that start coming out so absolutely we've run out of time we appreciate all the guests who joined us and spoke their heart out on this momentous day for india's democracy for more such videos subscribe to the newsx youtube channel hit the bell icon